Hello everyone, so welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Now today we are talking about the top 10 most effective Okinawan weapons. Now if you're interested in learning more about the top 10 most effective Japanese weapons, I've also made that video and you will find a link in the description below. Now there is one thing that I need to debunk right away. The idea of Okinawan weapons having evolved from farming tools. It's a very popular belief, but it's a myth for the majority of weapons in Kobudo, which instead were designed for combat. Now it is true that there are a couple of weapons that are basically repurposed tools, but the majority of them, that's not the case. It's a myth. Now this is a list of effectiveness. So imagine that you were to defend yourself using these weapons in a life to death combat scenario. Which weapon would give you a higher chance to overpower your opponent and stay alive? Number 10. Surujin. Surujin is basically a weighted chain. The most important factor in the construction of this weapon is the idea of being able to hide it and conceal it very easily. So if you were to be attacked in the middle of the streets because a thief or a burglar thought you were unarmed, you would surprise them swinging it around. And depending on the rotation, up to down, down to up, left to right, you will use it to attack the head of the opponent, temples of the opponent, or his groin. Now obviously having this weapon is better than finding bare hand, but it's not an easy weapon to control, even for trained people, this still isn't a weapon you can use easily against an opponent who is using a more effective weapon. It is theoretically possible to use it to wrap around the weapon of the opponent, but obviously in the real world that's easier said than done. Number 9. Eku. Okay, so the Eku is one of those weapons that originated from something that wasn't meant to be a weapon, namely, obviously, a boat oar. And although in the hands of a proper master this can become a deadly implement, it still isn't an actual weapon. It's a repurposed weapon, it's an improvised weapon. Interestingly enough, it is actually a weapon used by senior level practitioner of Okinawan Kobudo. It should be understood as something that you would carry with you and use for its purposes, moving around water while you are on a boat, but if you were to be attacked and you were a trained master in Kobudo, you could use it to strike effectively, even though the weapon in its design is obviously not optimized for combat. The blade of the oar can be used to block and strike at the same time, but I've been watching quite a lot of videos of actual masters of Okinawa and Kobudo, and one of the things that I noticed that kind of impressed me is the fact that they often put the bladed side on the floor and then they swipe with it before attacking and the way I understand this is because they are considering that an attack would probably happen on the beach while you were carrying this and therefore you can use the blade of the oar to throw the sand on the face of your opponent to blind him momentarily before attacking him on the throat. Really fascinating. Now before moving to the next weapon I'd like to mention the sponsor that made this video possible, Audible. Audible is a very nice site that I myself use where you can find audiobooks to listen to of all sorts. With Audible you can listen on your phone, on your tablet, but you can also listen wherever you are. Because if you get an Audible membership, you can also download your titles and listen to them offline. From podcasts to guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, A-list comedies and Audible originals, which are exclusive to Audible and you won't find anywhere else. Every month Audible members get one free audiobook and two Audible originals. Visit www.audible.com slash metatron or text metatron to 500 500 and get started with your free 30 days trial. Now one way that I like listening to audiobooks is while I polish my armor but also my many blades, uh, many weapons that I own. And of course that can be a little bit of a dull um, repetitive chore so thanks to audiobooks my mind can fly and start imagining all these things and all these settings and because I also listen to fantasy books and imagine all these worlds and before I know I'm finished. One audiobook I've been listening to and that I would wholeheartedly recommend to you is The Book of Five Rings by Miyamoto Musashi. It is very enjoyable to listen to and it's excellent to learn more about the strategic mind of one of the most famous samurai who have ever lived. Visit www.audible.com slash metatron or text metatron to 500 500. Number 8. Teko. 
Okay, so here we are already in the realms of weapon. No matter what they tell you, this is a weapon. It's a knuckle buster. Really easy to conceal. So you can literally put it inside your clothes. And if push came to shove, it would give you a boost to your hand-to-hand -hand combat. The reason why it doesn't score very high in my list is because that's what it is. It's a better, a more powerful, more deadly version of hand-to-hand. -hand. But it still is hand-to-hand -hand combat. It gives you zero range advantage. And it doesn't make you exceptionally effective at blocking someone who's attacking you with an actual weapon. So if you were in a situation where you were to fight another person hand-to-hand -hand who was, for example, bigger than you, then this could even the odds and even give you a reasonable advantage. Number seven, Nunchaku. Okay, so here we are jumping into the realm of the exceptionally well-known and popular weapons and that is because of the 90s and 80s and the films that we watched with Bruce Lee who was using this kind of weapon. The Nunchaku, it still is one of the traditional weapons in the Okinawan style but differently to um, Nunchaku that we usually see either in the movies or sometimes even in stores, the traditional Nunchaku would be made of wood and they would be linked not by a chain but either by rope or even more traditionally by horse hair. Some people will tell you that nunchaku originally derive from the sort of tools used to thresh rice, but there isn't evidence for that. If you look at the actual tools, you will see that there is a reasonable difference. Nunchaku are a weapon that were made for combat. Now again, it's not one of those exceptionally precise weapons, but it can be used to hit the temple, the wrist, the elbow and the knees. But of course, footwork also plays a pivotal role in the usage of, of nunchaku together with distance management. Trapping and other offensive maneuvers are also possible from very close range. Number six, Kama. I'm sure you must have noticed a pattern here. Generally speaking, in the Okinawa Kobudo tradition, weapons that are not particularly long will be used in pairs. And this is one rule that basically keeps true. And it's incredibly interesting. The idea of being able to use both hands requires a lot more training. But the moment you achieve it, then it turns you into a very effective duelist. Not something you would use in warfare, but definitely something you can use in 1v1 combat if you have the time to practice it. And if you were a Pechin, so basically the Okinawa version of a samurai you would have had a lot of time to practice anyway so the kama is a farming tool obviously it's a sickle repurposed slightly into a shape that makes it more of a weapon than a tool but this one is developed and evolved from a farming tool and it is something that you can still carry around and pretend you're going to cut weeds on the field if someone were to stop you asking why you're carrying weapons so this could be a weapon that some peasants could also get away with carrying since, as you know, in all Japan, and therefore also Okinawa, peasants weren't allowed to carry weapons, such as katana, yari, but that's just the norm. Personally, if I had a screaming guy running at me with two of these, I would be exceptionally scared for my life. And when you watch the actual Okinawan masters use these, you will see that they use them together, they strike with both, but they can also use them defensively, defend with one, attack with the other, and there are also several grips that help you balance out the lack of a pro proper balancement for something that, as we said originally, wasn't meant for combat. With something like this, you just need to hit, considering that they both have sharp blades. And if you manage to thrust in the eye of an opponent or the throat, well, the fight is over. Number five, ball. Okay, so the bo is the long stuff, although bo is the Japanese word for it. Traditionally, it's made of oak and it was quite long. In fact, six feet in length would be normal and that's in contrast with the jaw, which is actual Japanese, which would be a wooden stuff approximately four feet in length. So the bo, of course, gives you a very good range advantage and the hits can still be lethal. Of course, again, a hit from a kama would more easily be lethal than a hit from a bo. But with the bo, you have an exceptional range advantage against someone wielding two kama. So if you are fighting in an open area and you can keep on going back while hitting, it will be very difficult for the guy with the two kama and other even smaller weapons to catch up. While you keep on attacking, eventually you will hit him in the head, in the temple, hit him on the rib, break a rib. And therefore, personally, if I had to choose between a ball and the other weapon so far, I would go for a ball. It is very difficult to defend from a master who knows how to use a ball. Number four, Tomfa. It was difficult to choose between Tomfa and Bo, and the only reason why I put Tomfa slightly, and only slightly, above Bo in effectiveness is because Tonfa are really robust, they are very resistive, and they allow you to use your entire forearm to block. 
so you can use one to block while you close in and attack with the other and it will be then a matter of skill they are very similar to the sort of batons that law enforcement uses to subdue opponents what really sold the tonfa to me is the way that masters use them you can hook with them you can wrestle with them you can even use the short protruding end to very painfully attack solar plexus throat ribs and other areas it is a very fast paced nimble weapon and if i were a thief and i was going to attack someone and he turned out to be a master of tonfa combat i would run away number three sai all right, so this is my favorite weapon of all Okinawan weapons. I still put it number three and not number one because I'm trying to be realistic here. I'm not playing favorites. But the Sai is very, very intriguing. One thing that we immediately have to say is that, again, people will tell you that the Sai was originally a tool used in farming to plant seeds and poke holes on the ground, on the soil, and that is absolutely not true. The Sai was not invented in Okinawa. It was adapted for Okinawan combat, but the Sai is present in Chinese martial arts, it's present in Indian martial arts where it probably originated. It was always used for combat, it is a weapon 100%. It's a three-pronged weapon and the center, if you want to go traditional, is blunt and not sharp and it does not have a point. That is because it's not a weapon meant to kill your opponent. You do thrust with it and you can see this as you watch masters of Okinawan Kobudo but also styles of Okinawan Karate using it and they do thrust with it a lot. But you don't thrust the stub but you do want to put the person out of combat. And even though it doesn't have a point, a proper hit of a steel rod can still break your rib, it can still blind you in one eye, it can still incapacitate you. But what's interesting about this eye is the fact that you can use the two protruding sides called yoku to catch your opponent's weapon, to break your opponent's weapon, or to block people's wrists. So, because of the fact it's a full meta weapon, again used in pairs, good for both defending and attacking, it scores very high on this list. Number two, Timberochin. So, shield and short spear. And this can surprise people because in Japanese warfare and combat, we know that yes, shield existed, but they were abandoned in pre samurai era. So, we're talking basically in the Iron Age. But in Okinawa, they keep the shield. Now, given these are not elaborate shields, and sometimes the shields use a basically repurposed scutes forming the shell of turtles. So, they didn't really make shields the Western way, for example. And the usage of the short spear is also very interesting. Now, some people might ask, why not using an actual spear together with a shield? And my opinion in this is, again, contextual. It wasn't really created for warfare. This is not a battlefield weapon. It's something, again, you want to be able to carry. Conceal, possibly. But then again, carry. Because you can't really wear a spear. And if you think about even the Yari, the Naginata, the traditional samurai weapons that we know about, Japanese warfare. Well, they were used in battle, so they were basically carried in your hand. But you don't really wear a Yari or a Naginata or a Nodachi while you walk around town. So this is why I think they opted for the short spear and training in the short spear, because you can wear it easily and you can use it to defend yourself without impeding your ability to live your life normally. Obviously, the shield is used to block and defend from oncoming strikes and attacks, whereas the spear is used mostly to thrust and slash. A very effective weapon combination and very, very intriguing to see how Okinawan masters use it. Number one, Nuntibo. The Nuntibo is basically a spear, but it's a very interesting spear at that because you're basically attaching a sai to the ball, creating a combination of both weapons, which results in the characteristics of the sai, because it is used in a very similar way, together with the advantages of range that a ball gives you. So it's basically a more lethal ball. The head of the weapon, so the actual sai attached to it, it's a manji sai. Manji being the name of the kanji, so the character used to represent what it's basically a swastika, because a swastika was originally a Buddhist symbol of many Asian cultures, regardless of the fact that the Nazi used it as their own symbol. With the Nuntibo, you can block, you can thrust, you can strike, and you can even trap because of the fact that it allows you to hook. And hooking is very much present in Okinawan Kobudo. It's probably one of the main characteristics set these styles apart. That is the reason why the Nuntibo is number one on my list. All right, Noble Ones, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you're still not yet members of this community, become a Noble One. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.